This is Economics 1723 Capital Markets, the uh, module for the second lecture on measuring return and leverage and short selling. Uh, this is John Campbell. So today we're going to cover two topics. First of all, measuring return, and secondly, leverage and short selling, both of which are very basic foundational topics in capital markets. First of all, measuring return. What is return? Uh, it's a measure of the performance of a security as an investment and we're going to consider a specific case where we uh, buy the asset at some time t at a price capital P subscript t, call that PT, and then one period later two things are going to happen. First we're going to get a dividend uh, dt plus 1 which we're entitled to because we bought the asset the previous period and then we're going to sell the asset and get a price PT plus 1. So what we put in is PT, what we get out is DT plus 1 and PT plus 1. The gross return is just the ratio of what we get out to what we put in. So we're going to write that as 1 plus RT plus 1 is the ratio DT plus 1 plus PT plus 1 divided by PT. Now to calculate a net return what you do is you subtract 1 from that um, so, um, in an example, you know, if, if, the, if there's no dividend and the price goes up by 10% while you hold it between t and t plus 1, then the gross return would be 1.1 1 .1, and the net return would be, let's say, 0.1 or 10%. So the net return is the gross return minus 1, or we can write it like this. It's the ratio of dividend plus price tomorrow minus price today divided by price today. And then we can break that into two pieces. The income yield is the ratio of the dividend to the initial price. And the capital gain is the change in the price while you hold it divided by the initial price. So let's just work through an example quickly. Suppose you buy a stock at the beginning of the year for $50. At the end of the year it pays a dividend of $2. And then you sell it at the end of the year for a price uh, exclusive of the dividend of uh, 55, that's known as an X dividend price. What's the gross return? Well, it's dividend plus pr the price at the end of the year divided by the price at the beginning of the year. It's 57 divided by 50, that's 1.14. Uh, the net return subtracts 1, we're going to get 0.14 or 14 percent. We can break that 14% into two pieces. The income yield is the 2, the dividend of 2 divided by 50, that's 0.04 or 4%. The capital gain is the change in the price, which is 5 divided by 50, that's 0.1, which is 10%. So overall, net return 14%, income yield 4%, capital gain 10%. The next topic is compounding return. What does it mean to compound a return? Well. By convention, we uh, often report returns uh, on an annual basis, or at an annual rate. And we do that even if the period over which we initially calculate the return is different from a year. And the reason to do this is that it helps us compare returns in a, in a, in a manner that's, that's legitimate. In other words, all returns are being expressed in a common uh, time interval. Now, if you want to annualize returns, there's a correct way to do it, which is to raise the gross return to a power. So for an example, this quarter a stock has a return of 8%. The gross return is 1.08. And if you were to own the stock for four quarters and get the same gross return every quarter, after a year you would have a gross return of 1.08 to the power 4, which is 1.36. So in other words, you'd invest a dollar. After a quarter you'd have a dollar eight. You reinvest the dollar eight. After another quarter you have a uh, 1.08 squared and you keep doing that for a year, you're going to end up with $1.36, which is 1 1.08 to the power 4. So that means then that the annualized return in this example is 36%. That's not the same as 4 times 8%, which is only 32%. So this is, uh, this is the power, if you like, of, of compound interest. Well, here's another example. What annual return doubles your money over 10 years? Well, if, if the investment doubles your money over a decade, the gross return over that whole decade is 2. Uh, so to annualize that, we have to take 
the one-tenth power, because a year is a tenth of a decade, and 2 to the power one-tenth is 1 1.072. So actually an annual return of 7.2% will double your money if it's repeated each year for 10 years. Now, if you don't take account of compounding, you might think that 10% uh, each year for 10 years will get you 100% after a decade. But that, that's wrong. It's not 10%. It's only 7.2% needed. Um, now, I want to relate this to the idea of a portfolio, and we need to think how we measure portfolio returns. Recall that a portfolio is an investment in multiple assets. The return on a portfolio is a weighted average of the returns on the individual assets in the portfolio. And the weights are the fractions of the value of the portfolio that's invested in each asset. So here's the formula. The portfolio return RPT plus 1 is a sum over n assets of portfolio weights, which have to add to 1, times the returns on the individual assets. OK, so that completes our first topic, which is measuring return. The next topic is leverage and short selling. Now, the common element when we consider leverage and short selling is that portfolio weights can sometimes be negative. A negative weight on a money market asset represents borrowing or leverage. In other words, we borrow money now and we commit to pay it in the future. We have a riskless debt instead of a riskless asset. And that's equivalent to having a negative weight on a money market asset like um, you know, a money market fund. Now, a negative weight on a risky asset, such as a stock, represents short selling. What you do mechanically is you borrow a risky asset that you don't have. You sell it into the marketplace. You're committed to return the risky asset in the future. So in the future, you're going to have to buy it back. But of course, if the price of the asset goes down, you're going to profit from this strategy. So that's equivalent to a negative weight on a risky asset. Finally, note that a negative weight on any asset corresponds to a greater than 100% weight on other assets, because all weights together must add to 100%. So let's think about how leverage works in practice. Um, and we're going to use the term margin. Buying on margin uh, means that you only put up some of the money to buy the asset yourself. The fraction that you put up is called the margin, and the rest of it you borrow. So concretely, suppose you have a dollar, and there's a risky asset, we'll call that I, and a risk-free asset, which we'll write F, F for free of risk. Now, a conventional uh, uh, long position or set of long positions would be 50 cents invested in the risky asset and the other 50 cents in the risk-free asset. But a leveraged position would be something like this. We're going to invest $2 more than all the money we have in the risky asset. And we're going to have a negative weight of minus 1, minus $1 in the uh, risk-free asset. The negative position means you're actually borrowing one dollar. OK, well, what fraction of the purchased risky asset value did you, the investor, contribute? Well, you put up a dollar of your own money, and you bought two dollars of the risky asset. So the ratio of those two things is called little m. That's margin. And in this example, it's 50%. So you're buying the asset on 50% margin. Buying on margin, or equivalently taking leverage, enables you to take larger positions on risky assets than your own money would allow. Now, what's the return to buying on margin? Well, uh, to, to buy stocks on margin, what you'll do is you'll borrow from your broker at the risk-free rate RF, uh, plus you'll pay a fee to the broker. Now, the borrowing rate for this kind of borrowing is low because the purchased assets serve as collateral. If the value of the asset falls, then the broker uh, might ask you to put more money in uh, to your account. That's, that's called uh, making a margin call. Uh, if you fail to contribute more money, then the, the broker will be able to sell the asset um, and uh, use it to, to uh, pay off the, the loan. Uh, and so the broker is protected against your default by um, his ability to seize your assets. Uh, in the event that uh, they decline in value. All right, so if you buy on margin M and the borrowing rate is RF, 
then what's your return? Well, um, you own a share of the risky asset. It gives you RI. Um, of course, you've borrowed 1 minus M, and you have to pay the broker RF on that amount. And then all of this is divided by M because you only put up M, a uh, fraction M of your own money. If we rearrange these terms, we see that the return is the risk, the risk free rate RF plus 1 over M, the reciprocal of the margin, times the excess return on the risky asset. The leverage is this reciprocal 1 over M. Or in the case of 50% margin, the leverage is 2. And what leverage does is it multiplies the impact of the excess return on the risky asset. So the principle here is that buying on margin amplifies your exposure to fluctuations in risky asset returns. Now the final topic for today is short selling uh, in practice. How does it work? Uh, well, what you do is you borrow shares from a large institution that owns them and lends them out. You sell the stock and receive cash. You deposit let's say 102% of the value of the stock as cash collateral in a margin account. And that is to protect the uh, owner of the stock, or the broker acting on the owner's behalf, against uh, any default that you might have if you don't return the stock later. Now later, what you do, what you're supposed to do, is buy back the shares and return them to the lender. Now you profit if the stock price has declined while you were short. Of course, you lose if the stock price rises while you are short. Note here that in a short sale, the order of buying and selling is reversed. You sell the stock first and later you buy it back. Now, if the value of the shares goes up while you're short, you're going to have to increase your posted collateral to maintain the 102% ratio. In other words, you're going to get a margin call in that situation. Also, if the stock pays dividends, you must pay this amount to the owner of the shares. The lender can ask for the shares back at any time. This is a call loan of shares. In other words, the lender can call them, call them back. Uh, it's not for a fixed uh, uh, time. When you return the shares to the lender, you get back your collateral and interest. The interest paid on the collateral is normally slightly lower than the risk-free rate, and the difference is the lender's fee. If there's particularly strong demand to short a stock, the interest rate on the collateral may be much lower than the risk-free rate, and then we say the stock is on special. What is the return to short selling? This is the very last uh, topic. Well, suppose you use the proceeds of the short sale to provide the collateral. Then, for each dollar that you sell short, you're going to have to provide only two cents of your own money, because the other uh, dollar uh, of collateral that you have to put up is coming from the money you got when you sold the stock that you borrowed. Okay, so you're providing two cents of your own money, and the interest that you earn on the collateral, let's suppose that's exactly RF. What's the return on the strategy? Well, you have a um, dollar, a dollar two in the collateral account, and it earns RF. Uh, you are short one unit of stock, so you get a negative return minus RI, and all of this is divided by 0.02, which is the, uh, the, the, the money that you put up. So rearranging terms, we have RF plus 50 times the excess return on the risk-free asset over the stock. So this strategy has a leverage factor of 50, which is the reciprocal of 0.02. So this shows you how Short selling, in practice, can be very highly levered. You're getting a, a negative exposure to the excess return on the stock. You see there's a, a minus sign here in front of RI. And it's, a multiplied, uh, it's multiplied in this example by a factor of 50. Of course, you can increase leverage even further if you can find somebody to lend you money to, to provide this, uh, this, this two cents. Uh, but even in the absence of that, short selling can be done in a highly leveraged fashion. So hopefully that makes you comfortable with the basic mechanics of uh, calculating returns, compounding returns, uh, calculating returns with leverage, and calculating returns to a short selling strategy. Thank you.